Welcome back. As a true crime enthusiast, I have to admit that I didn't know a lot about William MacDonald's grisly crimes. Purported to be Australia's first true serial killer, I suspect there were others before him, but he may have been the first Australian to be tagged with the new term, serial killer. But that doesn't diminish the horror of his acts or the reason he gave for committing them. He was born in 1924 as Allen Ginsberg in Liverpool, England. He proved to be an unusual child, prone to taking long walks at night by himself, and on many occasions his mother had to call the police to go and search for him. He never sought company and remained friendless all of his life. In 1943, at the age of 19, he was enlisted in the army and transferred to the Lancashire Fusiliers, where he says he was raped in an air raid shelter by one of his corporals. He said at first he felt traumatised, but later came to the conclusion that he enjoyed the experience, but that it would prey on his mind for the rest of his life. Discharged from the army in 1947, he was diagnosed as having schizophrenia and committed for several months to a mental asylum where he was treated daily with electroconvulsive therapy. Deciding to start a new life, he changed his name to William MacDonald and emigrated from England to Canada in 1949 and then to Australia in 1955. Shortly after arriving in Adelaide, South Australia, he was arrested and charged with indecent assault on a male person and two counts of gross indecency after touching a detective's penis in a public toilet and was placed on a two-year good behaviour bond. He moved to Ballarat in the neighbouring state of Victoria, but his life always seemed to be dogged with trouble. While he was working on a construction site, his workmates gave him a hiding for being, as they put it, a poofter. It was in Brisbane, Queensland that William MacDonald's career as a murderer began. In 1960, he befriended 55-year-old Amos Hurst outside the Roma Street railway station. They had a long drinking session together in a nearby hotel and went back to Hurst's hotel room where they sat on the bed and drank beer together. The ageing alcoholic was so drunk that he probably had no idea that William MacDonald was strangling him until it was too late. Later, MacDonald would claim that he had no intentions of murdering Hurst when they went back to his room. But the urge to kill came on suddenly and he squeezed his hands tightly around Hurst's neck. As he was being strangled, Amos Hurst hemorrhaged and blood spurted from his mouth all over MacDonald's hands. MacDonald punched him in the face and Hurst fell to the floor, dead. He then undressed Hurst and put him into bed. He washed the blood from his arms, turned off the lights and quietly left the building. Terrified that police would knock on his door at any minute, MacDonald scoured the papers every day for the story of Hurst's murder, but no story appeared. Five days later, he found his name in the obituary column and couldn't believe his eyes. It said the man had died suddenly of a heart attack. Emboldened by getting away with the murder of Amos Hurst, William MacDonald went about his newfound career as a murderer with added enthusiasm. He bought a sheath knife and went looking around the wine bars and sleazy hotels of Brisbane for another easy victim to kill. In a wine saloon full of down and outs, MacDonald met a man named Bill. The more the pair drank, the more MacDonald thought Bill looked like the corporal who had raped him years before. At closing time, they took a couple of bottles of sherry to a nearby park. MacDonald's urge to kill was strong, but he waited until his drinking partner passed out on the grass. Taking the knife from its sheath, 
He was just about to plunge the blade into Bill's neck when the urge suddenly left him. He sat on the man's chest with the knife raised, but the desire to commit murder had gone. He put the knife back in its sheath and went home, leaving the world's luckiest derelict to sleep it off. The man would later become known as Lucky Bill. In 1961, MacDonald moved to Sydney in New South Wales. He found accommodation in East Sydney, where he became well known in the parks and public toilets that were secret meeting places for homosexual men due to the criminalisation of same-sex activity. He took a job as a letter sorter with the postal department under the assumed name of Alan Edward Brennan. But before long, the voices in his head were back, urging him to kill. On the night of Saturday, June 4th, 1961, he struck up a conversation with 41-year-old vagrant Alfred Reginald Greenfield as he sat on a bench in Green Park, opposite St Vincent's Hospital in the inner city suburb of Darlinghurst. Greenfield was a homeless, unemployed blacksmith. MacDonald offered him a drink from his beer bottle and lured him to the nearby Domain Baths on the pretext that he had more bottles in his bag. By day, the Domain Baths were a popular public swimming spot situated on Sydney Harbour. By night, they were the haunt of homeless and alcoholics of the city. The need to kill had by now become overwhelming, but MacDonald controlled his urge until the man drank all the beer and had fallen asleep on the grass. MacDonald removed the raincoat he'd brought in his bag and put it on, before taking the knife from its sheath. Kneeling over Greenfield, he brought the knife down swiftly and buried the blade deep into his victim's neck. He plunged the knife at least a further 30 times until Alfred Greenfield lay dead. The ferocity of the attack had severed the arteries in Greenfield's neck. MacDonald then removed his victim's trousers and underpants, lifted the testicles and penis and sliced them off at the scrotum. He then threw the genitals into the harbour, wrapped his knife in his raincoat put it in his bag and walked home. The following day, the murder was on the front page of every newspaper. They called it the work of a maniac and dubbed him the mutilator. The New South Wales government offered a reward of $2,000 for information leading to the arrest of the killer. On the morning of Saturday, November 21st, 1961, William MacDonald purchased a knife with a six-inch blade from Mick Simmons Sports Store in Sydney's Haymarket District. He told the owner that he was going fishing, but the urge to kill was back and stronger than ever. That night, MacDonald was walking down South Dowling Street in East Sydney when he saw 41-year-old Ernest William Cobbin staggering towards him. MacDonald lured Cobbin to the nearby Moor Park, where they sat in the public toilets and drank beer. Cobbin made no comment when his new friend put on a raincoat from his bag. Cobbin was sitting on the toilet seat when the first blow from the knife struck him in the throat, severing his jugular vein. Severely wounded and most likely in shock, Cobbin instinctively lifted his arm to defend himself. MacDonald kept stabbing, repeatedly wounding him on the arms, neck, face and chest. Even when Cobbin fell dead from the toilet seat, MacDonald kept up the frenzied attack. Again, he sliced off his victim's penis and testicles and put them in a plastic bag. When finished, MacDonald calmly took off his raincoat, wrapped his knife and the plastic bag in it, put them in his bag and walked out of the toilet. That night, he washed the grisly contents of the plastic bag and took it to bed. What he did with it is better left unknown. 
The following day, McDonald wrapped the plastic bag with its contents, the knife and a brick in newspaper, tied them with string and threw them from the Sydney Harbour Bridge into the deepest part of the harbour. This time, there would be no evidence to find. Police received a phone call that a body had been found in a toilet in Moor Park. The horror they confronted was unimaginable. The toilet was awash with blood, and in the minds of Sydney's toughest detectives, there was no doubt that a madman was on the loose. The victim was married with two children and had been living in the inner suburb of Redfern, but was living apart from his family at the time of the killing and had apparently taken to the bottle. Police staked out public toilets and known derelict haunts. Undercover police, disguised as vagrants, mixed with the down and outs of the many wine bars and hotels, but it all proved fruitless. As the months passed, police had to concede that they were no closer to catching the mutilator than they were when Alfred Greenfield's body was discovered near the Domain Baths. After Cobbins' murder, MacDonald's rage subsided and he went about his life as usual. But as the months went by, the urge to kill again became overwhelming. On the morning of Saturday, March 31st, 1962, MacDonald purchased another long-bladed, razor-sharp sheath knife from Mick Simmons' sports store. He packed it in his bag with his raincoat and a plastic bag. At 10pm that night, he left the Oxford Hotel in Darlinghurst and followed Frank Gladstone McLean down Burke Street and past the Darlinghurst Police Station. MacDonald struck up a conversation with the drunken McLean and suggested that they turn into Burke Lane and have a drink. As they rounded the unlit corner, MacDonald plunged the knife into McLean's throat. McLean felt the knife sink deep into his throat and started to resist. MacDonald stabbed him again in the face and punched him, forcing him off balance. As McLean fell to the ground, MacDonald was on him, stabbing him about the head, neck, throat, face and chest until he lay dead. MacDonald dragged the body a few metres further into the lane, lowered his victim's trousers and again sliced off the genitals. Again he wrapped his knife and the plastic bag in the raincoat, put it in his bag and strolled down Burke Street. He passed several people, but they paid him no attention. At 10.50pm, McLean was found lying in the gutter, dying. For the third or fourth time now, the mutilator, William MacDonald, had escaped being caught. Back at his room, he washed the contents of the plastic bag in the sink and in the morning, threw the incriminating evidence off the Sydney Harbour Bridge. The murders were unprecedented in Australian history. Police could not recall more violent or sickening crimes. A special task force was set up to track down the killer. Teams of detectives worked around the clock, checking out every possible lead. Still, the mutilator eluded them. In the meantime, things were not going quite so well for William MacDonald in his private life. In totally unrelated incidents, he had a falling out with his landlord, and in the same week he was fired from his mail sorting job at the postal department. MacDonald had saved a lot of money over the years, and he decided to go into business for himself. Still using the assumed name of Alan Brennan, he paid $1,120 for a mixed business in Burwood, an inner western suburb of Sydney. In his little shop, he made sandwiches and sold a variety of small goods. The shop was also an agency for a dry cleaning company. MacDonald loved it. He had no landlord standing over him and he didn't have to answer to anyone at work. He lived in the residence above the business and for the first time in his life, he was left alone. So when the urge to kill came on him again, the mutilator didn't have to worry about the risk of being caught doing his thing in a public place. 
He could bring his victims home and have his way with them there. The urge to murder and mutilate soon came again, stronger than ever before. And one night early in November 1962, MacDonald went to a wine saloon called the Wine Palace opposite the People's Palace in Pitt Street in the heart of downtown Sydney. There he met 42-year-old James Hackett, a petty thief and derelict who had only been out of jail for a couple of weeks. He took Hackett back to his new residence and continued drinking until Hackett passed out on the floor. MacDonald used a knife from his delicatessen to stab the sleeping Hackett. On the first plunge, the long knife went straight through Hackett's neck, but incredibly, Hackett woke up and shielded the next blow with his arm. The sudden move diverted the knife into MacDonald's other hand, cutting it badly. With blood pouring from the wound, MacDonald unleashed renewed homicidal rage on Hackett. He brought the knife down with both hands and plunged it through Hackett's heart, killing him instantly. The floor was awash with blood, but he continued the frenzied attack until he had to stop for breath. There was blood everywhere, splattered over the walls and ceiling, and it had collected in puddles on the floor. MacDonald bandaged his hand with a dirty dishcloth and set about removing Hackett's genitals but the knife was now blunt and bent from the ferocity of the attack. Too exhausted to go down to the shop for another knife, he hacked away at the victim's scrotum with the blunt and bent blade, before finally giving up and falling asleep where he sat, among the puddles of blood on the floor. By morning, the pools of blood had soaked through the floorboards and threatened to drip onto the counters of his shop below. It took him the best part of the day to clean up the mess. The huge pools of blood on the linoleum could not be scrubbed out, so he tore it up, broke it into bits and threw it out. He also removed all of Hackett's bloodied clothing, leaving only the socks. MacDonald dragged the naked body underneath his shop and left him there. Every few hours he went back to the body and dragged it a little further into the foundations of the building until it was jammed into a remote corner of the brickwork, out of view and almost impossible to see. He left all of the bloody clothing with the corpse. For the first time, MacDonald panicked. Only a few of the bloodstains had come off of the walls and there was blood all over the floorboards. Paranoid and terrified, he packed his bags and caught a train to Brisbane, where he moved into a boarding house dyed his greying hair black, grew a moustache and assumed the name of Alan MacDonald. Every day he bought the Sydney newspapers expecting to read of the murder of Hackett. He needn't have worried. A few days after MacDonald left for Brisbane, customers wanting to pick up their dry cleaning had become concerned that no one was at his shop. After three weeks, a putrefying smell was coming from the vicinity of the empty shop. After a month, the smell was so overwhelming that the neighbours called the health department, who in turn called the police to break the door in. The smell led police to the rotting body. The corpse was so badly decomposed that it was impossible to identify. It was sent to the morgue at nearby Rydalmere Hospital. The only thing they could determine was that it was a male aged about 40, the same age as the missing shop owner, Alan Brennan. Police assumed that Brennan had crawled under his shop for reasons unknown and had died there. They had no reason to suspect foul play. It was ruled as an accidental death and the body was buried in a pauper's grave at the Field of Mars Cemetery in Ryde under the name of Alan Edward Brennan. When his former co-workers at the PMG read of his unfortunate demise, they collected for a wreath and attended the small memorial service. In arguably the most extraordinary circumstances in Australian criminal history, William MacDonald, the man who had committed five atrocious murders, was a free man, only he didn't know it. 
Unaware that he was supposedly dead and buried, MacDonald stayed a short time in Brisbane before travelling to New Zealand. But the urge to kill was still with him and getting stronger every day. He had to kill again. And for reasons known only to himself, he had to return to Sydney to do it. In an interesting side note, to this day, the body of James Hackett appears to remain buried under MacDonald's assumed name, Alan Brennan. Apparently, and sadly, it has never been rectified. About six months later, one of MacDonald's former co-workers, John McCarthy, bumped head on into the supposedly dead Alan Brennan as he was walking down George Street in the heart of Sydney. McCarthy was shocked. You're supposed to be dead, he told MacDonald. MacDonald asked him what he meant. They found your body underneath your shop at Burwood. We went to your funeral service, McCarthy replied. If you're alive, who was the body under your shop? And why did you run away? As what had occurred began to dawn on MacDonald, he ran away from the man and down the street. By that night, he was on a train to Melbourne. John McCarthy went to the police, but they didn't believe him. The desk sergeant told him to go home and sleep it off. They still didn't believe him the following day when he went back and told them the same story. In desperation, McCarthy rang the Daily Mirror newspaper and spoke to renowned crime reporter Joe Morris. He didn't sound crazy to Morris and the paper ran the story. The legendary headline, Case of the Walking Courts, was born. Intense media interest in the bizarre case forced police to reopen the investigation. Closer scrutiny of the clothes found beside the dead man revealed that the number 1262 was written in indelible ink on the inside of the coat sleeve. The coat had been supplied to a Patrick Joseph Hackett on his release from Long Bay Jail on October 27, 1962, after serving a 10-day term for indecent language. An embarrassed police commissioner was forced to exhume the corpse and closer examination revealed the stab wounds and the mutilation to Hackett's penis and testicles. From a much closer examination of what was left of the fingerprints, they discovered that the body was that of the petty thief Hackett and not the mild-mannered shopkeeper, Alan Brennan. After the walking courts headline appeared in papers across the nation, other witnesses came forward, including a man whose business was next door to Brennan's shop. He told police that he was certain he'd seen Brennan and another man in the shop on the evening before Brennan disappeared. Police felt sure that at last, if not belatedly, they were finally on to the elusive, the mutilator. John McCarthy supplied an extremely lifelike identikit of the missing Brennan, and it was circulated on the front page of every paper across the country. Meanwhile, William MacDonald had taken a job on the railways in Melbourne, and even though he had dyed his hair and had a light moustache, his co-workers recognised him. When MacDonald asked the station master for his pay, the police swooped on the meek and mild-mannered little man who had brought Australia's biggest city to its knees. He was MacDonald didn't oppose his extradition to Sydney to face murder charges and confessed to everything. A crowd waited at Sydney Airport to get a glimpse of Australia's most grotesque and notorious serial killer. They were to be disappointed. The thin, short, shy MacDonald was nothing like the beast they had imagined. Charged with four counts of murder, he pleaded not guilty on the grounds of insanity. His trial, held in September of 1963, was one of the most sensational the country had ever seen, and the public hung on every word of horror that fell from the mutilator's mouth. When he testified, how he had stabbed one of his victims 30 times in the neck and then removed the man's testicles and penis, a jurywoman fainted. 
They didn't take long to find William MacDonald guilty of four counts of murder. Everyone thought that the mutilator was crazy, so were surprised when the jury chose not to go with public opinion and found him to have been sane at the time of the murders. Before passing sentence, Mr Justice McLennan said that it was the most barbaric case of murder and total disregard for human life that had ever come before him. William MacDonald had shown no signs of remorse and had made it quite clear that if he were free, he would go on killing as often as the urge came upon him. He was sentenced to prison for life and his papers were marked, likely to offend again. Shortly after his incarceration, he bashed another prisoner almost to death with a slops bucket in Long Bay Jail and as a result was declared insane by a panel of doctors. MacDonald spent the next 16 years at the Morissette Psychiatric Centre for the Criminally Insane on the New South Wales Central Coast, but in 1980 was found sane enough to be released back into mainstream prison society and was held in the protective custody section of Cessnock Prison. There he lived a reclusive existence, reading and listening to classical music, and became known as Old Bill. In 2015, at the age of 90, he was taken to the Prince of Wales Hospital for an abdominal perforation and died on the 12th of May that year. At the time of his death, MacDonald was the oldest and longest serving prisoner in custody in New South Wales. Thanks for watching and remember to subscribe for more murder, mystery and mayhem. Until next time.